let's turn to uh, patients with an EGFR mutation. And we've had some big advances over, over 20 years. We've had advances, particularly about five years ago, when first line to Grisso or osimertinib became a standard of care by beating first generation Iresta or Tarceva. And uh, since that time, we've known this can work for years, but it doesn't work forever. And we still are left scratching our heads, not sure exactly what to do when the cancer progresses beyond that. And we, there's chemo-based approaches. We still wonder whether immune therapy could help folks. Uh, but in the meantime, some investigational approaches that have advanced have focused on targeted therapies. And, and in truth, I would say that many of my patients are especially reluctant to do chemo-based treatment once you've been on immune on uh, targeted therapy for years. I, you know, once you've seen Puri, it's hard for them to go back to the farm. You know, and and patients are often fine with going on chemo-based treatment up front if that's what you have to do and all you've known. But if patients have been taking a pill for years, they're often enamored of targeted therapy as a concept. One of the more promising concepts has been an agent that's FDA approved for a very narrow subgroup of patients with a different kind of EGFR mutation called Exxon 20. This is a drug amivantamab or ribervant is its marketed name. It's called a bispecific antibody. So it's an antibody infused by vein that targets both the EGFR mutation and simultaneously MET, which is a different uh, mutation that uh, is an escape mechanism that can occur in acquired resistance after Tegriso. Uh, this has been combined with another pill-based uh, EGFR inhibitor, uh, lazertinib, which is a third generation drug, very similar to, to Grisso actually. And this combination has been presented in a, a couple of settings over the last few years. And we saw some more recent data at ASCO. These were as is shown here, some uh, pretty heavily treated patients, median of three prior lines of therapy, a lot. Uh, the vast majority <laughs> had gotten either frontline or second line osimertinib, tegristo, or had gotten various and sundry things over preceding years. And uh, the data look I would say encouraging, good. Response rate of 33%, that is significant tumor shrinkage and is, is shown in the waterfall plot here on the bottom uh, on the, the right. This, again, just to recap for folks, uh, here the horizontal line is no change and every line going down represents a patient with tumor shrinkage and the, the length of that line represents the extent of shrinkage and you can see that the vast majority of patients have some shrinkage of the cancer, even if it is not uh, enough to call uh, a significant response. Uh, most patients, most physicians will readily take modest shrinkage for some period of time or even not growing compared to the alternative. So uh, that counts for something. The median duration of responses is uh, 9.6 months. So they tend to last uh, on average about, about 9, 10 months. And uh, so, and this has been generally well tolerated. I would just ask a, a question broadly, starting with Gilberto. What do you think of this? And um, you know, what what are you most hopeful about as the next step after Tegriso? For I'm sure you have a bunch of these patients who oh, are doing well. Um, they may be on their way to thinking about next treatments, or if they're not, they're wondering what comes next. This is certainly a step forward. I'm not quite sure that we should be able or we should be using it in clinic right now. Lazertinib itself is not approved, but we have seen people advocating for trying to use um, Eventamab with um, Ozimertinib and just use that as a tyrosine kinase inhibitor slash monoclonal antibody combo. Uh, the main problem there is that we don't have specific data on that specific combination with those two agents rather than the two we see on screen. And we really don't know how these will compare to chemotherapy with immunotherapy. While we usually feel that immunotherapy is not as effective 
in patients with EGFR mutations in particular, there's the occasional patient with EGFR mutation that actually has wonderful responses to immunotherapy. I just saw this morning, one of my patients was 85 years old and he's been on immunotherapy for about four years after treatment with first generation, third generation, and several chemos actually failed uh, to control his disease. And he's been on immunotherapy with a complete response. It's not the usual. We will continue to mention so that everybody remembers that immunotherapies are not necessarily the best treatments for patients with DGFR mutations, and especially not for patients with ALK translocations, but there is a benefit of using chemotherapy with or without immunotherapy. So is this gonna be better than that? Uh, the side effects certainly are likely to be better with a non-chemo containing regimen, but that's not always necessarily the case. So I think we do need to continue on the path to develop this combination and others. And especially we do need to figure out uh, which are the patients and the causes of resistance that would be ideally targeted by this. So I think that we truly have to segment and we should not use a blanket treatment for all patients living with the GFR mutant lung cancer that progress on osimertinib. We should really and truly find who are the patients who benefit from each of our therapies. So are patients with MAD amplifications the ones that are gonna benefit from a MAD treatment? Are our patients that don't have any specific causes gonna do better with chemo with or without immunotherapy? So I think that we will need to make our um, trials moving forward very specific. Jerushka, what are your thoughts here about, you know, your patients with this cohort? Um, are, are they highly resistant to the concept of chemo or are, you know, where, where do targeted therapies versus chemo-based treatment with or without immunotherapy fit into the sequence? Yeah, you know, I have to say I was very excited by these data, similar to the, um, the, the previous study that we talked about of um, the uh, Siramza and Pembrolizumab, I feel that this is a real area of need for patients. Um, after uh, first-line osimertinib and chemotherapy, we really don't know where to go, and we're reaching for those chemotherapy agents that we don't really want to reach for, to be honest with you. So I think these data were very welcome. And that a median duration of response of 9.6 months to me is a, a very exciting finding and hopefully something that we will see bearing out in, in bigger um, phase three type studies. Um, so I, I, I was very um, heartened by that. Um, I would, I guess, uh, present the alternative thought to Gilberto regarding um, biomarker selection. I think that that's what we thought originally with OC Merchinib and T790M, but then giving it up front to patients regardless of the presence of that alteration appeared to benefit patients. So I do wonder if um, this may end up being something that is a benefit to all patients regard regardless of a mechanism of resistance. But I think, um, you know, I would say this is the combination to watch or the one that I'm watching closest in this space. Um, and I also thought that the toxicity profile was, um, you know, what one would expect um, and therefore no surprises there. Right. And, and now I'll have to counter argue that maybe we only saw a benefit with us Mertinib because we only treated uh -huh. patients in the second line who didn't get it in the first line if they had the 79 m mutation. So it might be actually the other way around. Well, we, we thus far with this series, we have not seen a striking difference based on MET, presence of MET or not. So there's still more to learn, but um, you know, thus far, it doesn't seem like this hinges completely on uh, you know, prior therapies or, or uh, molecular testing going into it. 